use. So nobody is going to want to do that. Because of the fruit there of is uncertain. And consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor the use of the commodities that can be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And which is worst of all, why is this worst of all? What does it mean for it to be worst of all? Contrary to our strongest desires, baddest of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And therefore, the life of man in this natural condition is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and maybe worst of all, short. Okay. What Hobbes is doing here is listing all of these things that would result from a state of war of all against all in order to show that nobody in the state of nature, nobody would be able to satisfy their desires very well. Most importantly, stay, by staying alive. He assumes that this is the strongest desire that almost everybody has. We have lots of other desires also. But in the state of nature, where there's this insecurity, nobody is invulnerable, there is constant threat, nobody will be able to satisfy this strong desire very well. Nobody will be able to satisfy any of these other desires very well either. And therefore, and therefore, what will we all say about this condition? It's bad. Notice, all of us will say that this is bad. It's bad for each of us. When I say it's bad, it means I have an aversion to it. I can't satisfy my desires very well. When you say it's bad, it means you can't satisfy your desires very well there. But notice that if Hobbes' argument is right here, we can all reach agreement that this condition is right. <laughs> hmm? is bad. That this condition is one in which nobody can satisfy their desires effectively. So, although we have a subjective account of values, although we have different assessments of good and bad from different people, our assessments of good and bad are relative to our desires, we have different desires, Hobbes has argued here that we will all agree on this one. It's rational for all of us to well, what's it going to be rational for all of us to do? Try to avoid this condition. Try to create something else besides this. For me, so that I can satisfy my desires better. For you, so that you can satisfy your desires better. But we will all see, well, for this one, it would be rational for all of us to see that getting out of this condition would be an effective way of satisfying each of our most important desires. <coughs> but wouldn't uh, people that desire to be considered to be a good state though? Maybe, maybe. Uh, but they're going to be threatened by everyone else also. And so maybe there are some people who like to fight. Presumably they don't like to die though. And nobody's so much more powerful than everybody else that they are immune from threats of other people. So I guess I do want to say, okay, if you really push me in this direction, we could imagine somebody who doesn't care about death, who doesn't care about commodious living, who only wants to fight. Yes, in that case, Hobbes will not be able to show that that person would be rational to get out of the state of nature. Hobbes assumes that there are very few such people. As a matter of fact, there are very few. Okay, 
Um, so there's a sense in which the rest of the discussion of Hobbes is going to be explaining how we do this, how we put an end, how we get out of the state of nature. There's a sense in which this is now sort of the turning point where we start to have an account of building a positive account of the rationality in terms of instrumental rationality for satisfying each person's own desires of getting out of the state of nature. But before we do that, he considers a few objections to this account. So on 77. Objections. Objections to the account that he's just given of the state of nature. Right? So somebody might say, no, 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 Hobbes. You're all wrong. You, Hobbes, you believe that human nature is evil. But in fact, Hobbes, human nature is good. People wouldn't fight all the time in their natural condition. We'd just get along happily with one another. We wouldn't be in conflict all the time. The state of nature would, be, would not be a state of war. It would be a state of peace. So we can imagine this first objection, somebody saying, no, 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 Hobbes, human nature is good, not bad, not evil the way you describe it. And over on page 77, Hobbes has two replies to this objection. The first is, very top of page 77. So you imagine somebody saying, no, 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 human nature is good, People would get along with one another, no problem. And Hobbes' reply, first reply says, well, let this person therefore consider with himself when taking a journey, this person making the objection arms himself and seeks to go well accompanied. When going to sleep, he locks his doors. When even in his house, he locks his chests. And he does all this, look at the person's behavior, and he does all this, when he knows that there are laws and public officers armed to revenge all the injuries done to him, what opinion he has of his fellow subjects when he rides armed, of his fellow citizens when he locks his doors, and of his children and servants when he locks his chests? Does he not there as much accuse mankind by his actions as I do by my words? So look at how people actually behave, not what they say about human nature being good. Look at how people actually behave. And look at how people actually behave in society, where there are laws and police officers and courts and jails designed precisely to deter them from bad actions. They still don't trust each other. So this is a kind of ad hominem reply. Right? The person who says people are good actually in their actions doesn't behave. But the second reply is a much more important one. Here he says, just I'm continuing that paragraph, he says, but neither of us, neither the person who rides armed in society, nor I, neither of us accuse man's nature in it. The desires and other passions of man are in themselves no sin. No more are the actions that proceed from those passions until they know a law that forbids them. And until a law is made, they cannot know such a law. Nor can there be a law made until they've agreed upon the person that shall make it. Okay, so most importantly here, Hobbes is saying, I'm not saying that human nature is evil. I'm not saying that human nature, that human beings are naturally bad. I'm not saying that their desires are naturally bad. We'll come back to this, why he insists on this, but what he's saying here is that basically the logic of this situation is one that will bring people <coughs> into conflict with one another. The problem is not the content of their desires. Whatever desires people have, if there are scarce resources, 
or even a threat of scarce resources, without some mechanism to resolve disputes, this is going to be the logic. <laughs> It's not that he's assuming people are naturally mean to one another. He's not making very much of, uh, assumptions about the content of people's desire to trust, except their own self-preservation. But that's not objectionable. <coughs> so Hobbes, importantly, denies, I say it again, importantly, Hobbes denies that he has a negative view of human nature. He denies that he has an assumption that human beings are naturally evil or mean or bad or something like that. So he's saying like the desires for riches should be blamed for this He's not saying that. No. There's nothing objectionable about our natural desires, most importantly, to preserve ourselves. There's nothing objectionable, nothing bad or evil or objectionable. And if we simply have those desires in a condition of relative equality, where we are relatively vulnerable to one another, and there's no mechanism for resolving disputes, this is what's going to happen. So you would describe someone who is um, wanting to dominate as not as evil because it's their desire to, to dominate? Um, so we have to worry just a little bit about that case. Um, but I want to emphasize the other cases, scarcity and distrust, as the cases that are enough to make the state of nature a state of war of all against all without condemning the desires themselves. So this being objections meaning that he more or less believes the opposite of this. He's just saying this as a... Uh... He believes that the state of nature would be a state of war of all against all. And he denies that his argument for that is based on an assumption that human nature is bad. His argument is that simply having maybe innocuous desires, ordinary desires that are neither good nor bad in themselves, like especially to preserve ourselves, if we're vulnerable to one another, there's a chance of scarcity, and there's no way to resolve conflict, that's enough for the state of nature to be stable. Let me say one last thing uh, on Hobbes and human nature. I mean, it's easy enough, given this picture, to think of Hobbes as what, a warmonger? Somebody who thinks that human nature is natural for people to fight and something like that? Hobbes is a philosopher of peace. <laughs> Hobbes is interested precisely in finding a rational way of avoiding this. He is not wallowing in this. He is trying to find a way to avoid it. <laughs> Okay, um, so we'll finish, um, we'll finish talking about chapter 13 on Friday, read through the end of chapter 15, that is through page 100 of the